So leaky gut. Leaky gut is a condition in which the integrity of the tight junctions in the intestinal mucosa is disrupted, resulting in a loss of the normal intestinal barrier function and malabsorption. What on earth does that mean? So here's the deal. Inside of the gut, inside of the small intestine and the large intestine, is outside of you. It's not until whatever it is we put into our guts, into our mouths and travels inside, crosses the mucosal barrier, the cells lining the intestine, and then enters the bloodstream that it moves into us. So everything inside the guts outside of us, and it's not until it gets across that mucosal barrier that it gets into us. Now there's a couple of ways in which food is brought into the body, but we're going to focus specifically on these things called tight junctions. Tight junctions are the spaces in between cells, and they're lined with lots of immune cells. And so their purpose is to allow only little tiny molecules to come in and enter from inside the gut to inside the bloodstream. If those are swollen, if they're open wide, what happens is large molecules start passing across the gut into the bloodstream. The body does not like large molecules. So it looks at large molecules and it says antigen, and it makes an antibody response to it. Now we have inflammation going on. And what will happen is with people who have leaky gut, they suddenly find they're allergic to more and more and more and more and more foods. So you went from finding that you were intolerant to one or two types of foods to over the course of a year or two, suddenly you're finding you're eliminating everything and the only thing you're allowed to eat is grapes. Red grapes. <laughs> it's nuts. And then we start on all these elimination diets trying to chase this thing, when in fact this is the issue and what we need to be chasing, we need to be focused on is how do we seal your gut. Now the good news is we do have to eliminate a lot of those foods early on, but we can probably give them back to you later on once the gut seals. So leaky gut is a very serious problem and occurs unfortunately under a large number of circumstances. So irritable bowel syndromes, food sensitivities, joint pain, autoimmune diseases, SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, can all be attributed to leaky gut, as will celiac, we'll talk about in a minute. Depression, fatigue, and skin rashes. Look at this, leaky gut can create all of this stuff. Irritable bowel syndrome, problems with gas, bloating, diarrhea, constipation. All right? It is normal to pass, to have a normal, regular bowel movement two times a day. Should be large, well-formed stool. If you're having a bowel movement every other day, every three days, every four days, you got a problem. It's not normal. The gut's not processing food properly. You're not feeding yourself properly and you haven't got proper motility in the gut, and you haven't got proper digestion of your food. So we need to pay attention to all of these little symptoms because they build, they accumulate. And one day you say, you know, everybody comes in. I, my, my history start with, when was the last time you were in excellent health, that you felt vital and strong? And everybody gives me a date. Okay? And then we start getting into their history. And so the last time I was completely in great health, until I, uh, one kid, uh, mom brought me, he was in perfect health, excellent health, until six months ago when he starts developing chronic daily headaches. All right, been through the mill of neurologists and pediatricians trying to figure out what's going on, but he was in perfect health, nothing wrong, nothing wrong, and I'm spending an hour and a half with this kid trying to get all this information, but he's healthy. Ten-year-old kid, after all, how much could have happened? I go to do an exam in him and I look at his ears. There are tubes in both his ear, his tympanic membranes. So I turned around and I said, well, how long have those been there since you're not born with tubes in your ears? <laughs> oh, since he was four. A lot of uh, ear infections? Yeah. A lot of antibiotics? Yeah. So he's had, this is his third set of tubes because every time they take them out, he gets infections again and they start another round of antibiotics. It is, so people lie to me all the time. You're all very nice people. And I know you don't mean to lie, but the fact of the matter is when you really start getting down to it, you start to get this history of how these things accumulate over time. 
And the reason it's so important to know about this stuff is because the causes of leaky gut are in part antibiotics. No one, no one should ever receive an antibiotic without receiving a probiotic. Period. How much probiotic? You should probably be taking about 25 billion colony forming units of a probiotic a day. All right, some people can't tolerate that. We'll have them take five to 10. But, you sh but if there's 100 trillion cells in the gut, 1,000 different species in the gut, 25 billion is still a drop in the ocean. So antibiotics, lots of them in particular, help cause leaky gut. Ischemic bowel disease, uh, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease absolutely result in leaky gut. Stress. Anybody have stress? <laughs> stress causes leaky gut. Parasitic infections, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. We'll talk about that in a sec. Um, the cytotoxic drugs that we're using uh, to treat uh, rheumatoid arthritis or cancers, uh, and excessive alcohol consumption and regular alcohol consumption. More than two glasses of wine a day will cause leaky gut. So in the anti-inflammatories, anybody here take Advil or Motrin? Anybody ever use that? Okay, here's the deal. We are so focused on the gastritis that it causes, and the reason we're focused on the gastritis is because we got another pill we can sell you to do something for it. Because we never talked about how bad the ulcerations were and how frequently, and the answer is 3,200 people die a year in this country because of complications from uh, non steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. Okay? We didn't talk about them. We didn't talk about them because we didn't have a treatment. 32,000 hospitalizations result a year because of these medications. As soon as we started finding something that might help in terms of the gastric ulcers that they cause, we started saying, oh, by the way, there's a lot of people with gastric ulcers who are taking NSAIDs. And here's Caraphate. Take this, that'll take care of that problem for you. Here's proton pump inhibitors that may help. This is a bigger issue. We don't talk about this, and it is in the literature. It's not subtle. So 60 to 80% of individuals within 24 hours of taking an NSAID, and people who are 50 to 70% of people who are chronically using NSAID develop chronic intestinal inflammation. That is, if we take an endoscope down and we go look in your small intestine, we find that the whole damn thing's inflamed as a result of chronic use of NSAIDs in the overwhelming majority of people who are taking it. So chronic use of NSAIDs result in leaky gut. Not in everybody, but in the overwhelming majority of people who take them. You take it once, and this is, your this is the risk in terms of taking it once periodically, 60 to 80%. But if you start taking them on a regular basis, and the gut will heal. The gut basically turns over in about five days in all the cells in the gut. So the gut will heal uh, after that assault. The question is, how many times do you assault it before it stops healing? That becomes the question. So yeah, once every now and then, not going to do you in probably. But on a chronic basis, and since 29% of the population is chronically using NSAIDs, we got a problem. And think about it, it's all this stuff adding up a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, as we start creating these impairments and things that we put up with. We put up with gas, we put up a little bloating, we put up with a little bit of reflux. All right, and what do we do for the reflux? For the reflux, we take a uh, proton pump inhibitor, okay? And what do we do when we stop the production of acid in our stomach? Well, acid isn't there so we could invent a pill to stop its production. Acid is there to help us digest our food and the first line of defense against bacteria and viruses that come into our body with our food. So to completely eliminate the acid is actually a stupid thing to be doing. There's a time and a place and sometimes you have to do it. Okay, but there are other ways to go about treating these things and we need to be smarter and more thoughtful about what we're doing. So there are specific tests that can be done in order to determine whether or not you have uh, bacterial overgrowth and whether or not you have a leaky gut, okay? So what happens is there's a whole changeover in the flora in the intestine that happens uh, as the gut leaks. And this is just an example of a small bowel uh, bacterial overgrowth test. Basically what we do is we have you uh, drink a fluid, uh, lactulose, and we see whether or not you start producing uh, hydrogen and methane from it over what time. The longer the time period out, the further down in the intestinal tract 
is the problem. All right, this is about 24 foot of small intestine. So the longer that that is going up, and a difference of about 12 from baseline to the maximum, says that you've got significant bacterial overgrowth. Now, what does that mean? Again, we go back. There is about 100 trillion cells, bacterial cells, sitting in the gut. Now, the other thing you need to know is that that is most of the DNA in our body. So only 10% of all the DNA in our body is human DNA. And that's a tough thing to get your brain around because all the rest of the DNA in your body is bacterial DNA. The DNA and it's found on your skin, it's found in, in the intestinal tract, it's found in the, <coughs> in the nose, okay? We are just beginning to understand how important that other DNA is because that other DNA interacts with our DNA and it's that interaction that results in us. So studies are going on now where we're starting to look at the fingerprint, that is all of the different types of bacteria that are in the gut and the concentration of the bacteria in the gut. That's not in your slides unfortunately, but this is pretty new data that we're starting to look at. And we're asking the question, what's the relationship between the gut bacteria and our health? And what we're finding is in people who have obesity issues, and they say no matter what they eat, they can't lose weight. Well, it may actually be true, because the composition of the gut bacteria in them is different than it is in other people. And so we're asking if we can change over that bacteria, will we be able to assist them in being able to lose weight? But it goes even deeper than that. We know that in certain pain conditions, a pain condition called complex regional pain syndrome, which is a really nasty critter which results in swelling and pain to just kind of gently brushing the arm or the leg that's affected. The composition of the gut flora in those individuals is significantly less diverse and there's a couple of particular species that are significantly overgrown in those people than in controls, than in normal people. And we're finding in condition after condition after condition in diabetics that that bacterial overgrowth that that change in the composition in the bacteria is directly related. We're starting to find correlations. We're also finding it in people who are depressed. So we may actually be able to take a stool sample from you one day and tell you what your, your problems are. So understanding that and being respectful of the composition of the floor of the gut, thus what we're putting in our mouths, and being careful with all of that, is critical in order for us to have excellent health. Treatment of leaky gut, stop all alcohol, stop all NSAIDs, the anti-inflammatory diet, treat any parasites or dysbiosis. All right? Most of the testing that gets done for parasites is ineffective because the solutions that um, we use to transport the stool kill the parasites and so it frequently gets missed on standard stool sampling. You need really to go to some specialized labs that's, uh, that are able to look for this stuff, have a much higher hit rate. And you'd be surprised how many people are walking around with parasites or uh, bacterial overgrowth. And that needs to be addressed because that's part of the leaky gut syndrome. So that analysis needs to be performed. Treatment uh, comes in the form of things like glutathione, uh, N-acetylcysteine, L-glutamine, uh, prebiotics and probiotics. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. There's another thing. There is a medication, by the way, for those who have um, uh, irritable bowel syndrome. Again, it's bacterial overgrowth. So Zyfaxin is a non-absorbable antibiotic. There are good trials that look at uh, treatment uh, with this medication for about 14 days uh, and about a 30% resolution of irritable bowel syndromes uh, in individuals who we treat with this. So, Again, there are medications in addition to uh, supplements and dietary things that can all be done in order to address this problem. So you want to partner with your physician in talking about this stuff and figuring out what's going to make the most sense for you in order to diagnose and then address these issues. What you don't want to do is ignore the issue. Uh, L-glutamine, you use between 1,500 to 15,000 milligrams per day. It has to be cold because if you uh, heat it up, you denature it, and so it's no longer effective. Uh, dietary sources include animal proteins, raw spinach, cabbage, parsley, milk, and yogurt. 
prebiotics. Prebiotics are essentially fiber, all right? And they're selectively fermented dietary ingredients that result in specific changes in the composition and or activity of the gastrointestinal microbiota. The microbiota is all of the uh, bacteria that sit in the intestinal tract. So prebiotics, think of it as the scaffolding on which the probiotics actually need to settle in order to do the job they need to do. And probiotics are essentially fiber. Probiotics, on the other hand, are live microorganisms which, when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit on the host. Lactobacillus, bifidobacter, those are the big family names of a multitude of species which are being studied for a variety of different health conditions. But overall, taking a good probiotic, and a good probiotic has to be refrigerated in order to keep the cultures live. All right, the yogurt that you're eating has maybe a billion CFUs in it, and by the time it's been transported, uh, maybe dead, may not be. So what you want is therapeutically something that's live not just put in so they can say they put it in. So you want to be taking a product which is preferably refrigerated uh, and has some level of quality control on it uh, so that you know uh, how, whether or not it is live probiotics and well, how many colony forming units are in it. Uh, Saccharomyces boulari, Lactobacillus, and Bifidobactam are the species most commonly used for therapies. The Saccharomyces boulari is one that you don't normally need to take but one which is, has the big, longest track record in far as uh, preventing the overgrowth of bacteria in the gut from antibiotics. So specifically we get concerned about a thing called Clostridio difficile, which uh, when you take antibiotics, if you end up with a severe diarrheal disease uh, from the antibiotic, that's a consequence of the C. diff overgrowing in the gut. C. diff can rapidly take over most of the flora in the gut and be a real bear in order to try and get rid of it. The Saccharomyces boulari taken whenever you take an antibiotic has been shown to be effective in preventing the occurrence of C. diff. Now C. diff is a very interesting species. There's about a hundred different C. diff species in the body. All right, some of them produce some really nasty toxins that are neurotoxins. And it has been demonstrated in some kids who have ADD, ADHD, some kids who have been frankly psychotic and depressed, that there's been an overgrowth of C. diff in their gut producing chemicals that end up moving into the brain and interfering with the production of certain neurotransmitters, specifically dopamine. Stops the breakdown of dopamine, causes an increased amount of dopamine. The end result is all of these neurologic symptoms, these psychological symptoms. Right? So then you go start treating with ADHD medications. You use the Adderall, use the Ritalin, okay, or you're using antipsychotic medications. But really what you can do in some of these cases, if that's the problem, is an antibiotic that'll wipe out the C. diff, repopulate the gut with probiotics, and the whole problem goes away. Because they were being poisoned by an overgrowth of bacteria in the gut. So we want to prevent that from happening by using these things on a regular basis. All right? These, I think, are just kind of an everyday health profile worth doing. So 25 billion, 10 billion to 25 billion colony forming units live, taken every day with food. That, the Saccharomyces boulari, uh, I only use when I've got people on antibiotics. And I use it for the duration of antibiotics plus two weeks. So uh, this is, if you look at uh, Gallon's website, he's got a really nice discussion on leaky gut uh, and uh, a whole bunch of ways to go about treating it.